Bibles this evening to Luke chapter 18. I had a, a thing all planned out. I think we'll kind of shift just a little bit from that. <coughs> Continue on the same pathway, but I don't, uh, well, if I didn't say anything, you wouldn't know what we're going to do anyway. <laughs> we'll just pray the Lord will bless. How about that? Uh, verse 15, chapter 18, verse 15. Jesus blesses children. Uh, been dealing with a Catholic guy on uh, one of the chat things on uh, Facebook there. It is amazing to me how somebody can be so far off on just about everything that their mouth opens to and get so adamant that nobody knows anything but them. Pray that's not us. <laughs> Let it be somebody else. Uh, his, his logic was that uh, it's right, must be right to baptize babies because there were a lot of families that got saved in the Bible and every family has children in it. And I thought, man, that is about as, uh, as pretzel logic and twisted as you could possibly come up with. Uh, that the Lord has an interest in children is evident. That where there is no law, uh, there is no transgression. And where there is... Uh, Nobody knows what's going on. The Lord doesn't hold that against them. That's why even in our courts, people are mentally defective or judged differently than, uh, I guess, what we think of as normal people. Uh, that's just the, the way God has made things. Uh, let me read you Psalm 131, a couple of verses from that. Psalm 131, verse 1 says, uh, A song of the degrees of David. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty, neither do I exercise myself in great matters, or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul, uh, uh, my soul is even as a weaned child. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. In all that, say, what is this weaned child? I think it's a a missing element of society today. The implication is that when a child is nursing, when they get hungry, all they can do is struggle and fuss because they can't do anything literally themselves. But once they're weaned, now you know how to control yourself. Now you're going to learn how to deal with yourself. And I think that's how David kind of portrays all these things. So. Uh, as, as wonderful as children are, it's a good thing they don't stay that way forever. It would be very trying after a while. They'd be cute as could be, but it would be very trying after a while. So it's a, there's growth in these things. We think of uh, what Jesus said down here in verse 15. He says, and they brought unto him also infants, that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them, thinking perhaps that, uh, well, this is the master. He's not going to be bothered with little children or infants. And the truth of the matter was that uh, the God that made man made them in such a way that those infants taught you some things about your relationship to your family, to your parents, uh, and a parent to that child. So he used all of those things in every, every uh, aspect of men's ages, children's ages, and so forth is important to the Lord because they all serve as illustrations of one way or another, how we all relate, how we all grow, how we all uh, have needs, how we all fuss and kick and fight and we don't get our own way. But uh, in that uh, verse that I read, I quieted myself. Surely I have be sit, behaved myself, I behaved and quieted myself. I think what's missing today, before we get too deep in our message, just to People don't know how to calm themselves. They don't know how to quiet themselves. Years ago, it would be just go sit down and calm down. Now it's go sit in the corner, get all wound up on the, on the nightmare or 
don't do, they can't, nobody can just sit quietly and do nothing. They're just bored out of their mind because there's nothing internal to think about. There's nothing internal to just quiet themselves. One of the things that we're going to deal with uh, maybe a little bit tonight, probably next week, about these things is in the religious world, there can be no calming effect because there is never an assurance that your things are okay. For a Christian, when you got saved, what did you learn? Whew. I'm in. It's okay. I got things I got to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's okay. I'm going to be all right. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. I can calm myself. I have a Bible. I can sit and if I don't have it in front of me, I can just run some verses through my head. I can think on Bible stories. I can uh, compare my life to some situations and circumstances to see how I'm doing. The average person in the world has nothing like that. All they do is, since they've been taught nothing but advertising and self, is just demand of somebody something else. Entertain me, come to me, take care of my needs, keep me excited, keep me churned up. They can't quiet themselves. There's no, there's no ability, there's nothing in them that allows them to quiet themselves. And when you see somebody that can do that, it, it's bizarre. But that used to be common. That's why people could, could be alone and not panic. They could live in a quiet house and not, not think they got to have 15 things roaring and blasting and, and music in every room and all that kind of stuff. They liked being quiet. They were pretty happy with themselves for whatever reason. As Christians, you and I have got excellent reasons to be happy in ourselves. But if they were talking to some people, I watched a few minutes of about as much as I could stand uh, of the New Year's stuff the other night. And they were asking people what were their resolutions. They asked three people, and every one of them said a version of exactly the same thing. I'm going to learn to care more for myself and love myself more this year. My guess is the problem they're having already is they love themselves way too much and they just can't figure out how to give themselves any more of that love, but they're going to work on it all year long. <laughs> what they're going to do is make themselves even more miserable by this time next year. So let's read on. Uh, they brought him also evidence that he would touch them, but when his disciples saw it, they rebuked him. Them. But Jesus called uh, them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say to you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. Uh, let me ask you something. How do little children receive things? Usually if you tell them you got something for them, they're Everything's new, it's all a surprise. They're excited. Until they get to be three or four, every time mom or dad call them, they come because there's something for them. After that, they realize I've done something. <laughs> there may be other things going on there. But they come with the idea, I'm going to get attention. That there's always this optimism in coming when you're called or coming to, uh, to someone else. So let's look at that, uh, these verses here again briefly. I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of the evening on this. But. So uh, he rebukes his disciples because they won't allow the children. They thought children were a waste. Uh, I'll be honest with you. Uh, our church is, uh, is uh, having an abundance of children. Mm -hmm. It'll be a few years. But you know what the problem with churches is today? Those children don't don't grow in the Lord. They grow away from the Lord and they grow, quite frankly, away from their family. There is such an allurement to the world, to, to the whole culture, uh, the, the music, everything today is to draw kids away from family. They can't wait to get by themselves. They can't wait to get away from their family. It used to be they couldn't wait to get together with family to do something, just to get together. Now it's maybe up in our late 20s or 30s begin to realize how valuable family is and start kind of trying to pull it back together, but it's just so fragmented. 
So the Lord puts a great value on these, these children. They are the future of any enterprise. They are the children of the future of the family. Uh, the Oriental cultures, they recognize that quite well. Sooner or later, those kids are going to be taking care of me. So they're trained uh, and raised up in a way to have very great regard for, for older people, for the elderly. Today, there, there's none of that in America. I mean, there might be a little bit of lip service, but by and large, once you get where you can't earn a paycheck and do anything else, society just looks at you as you're just dead weight. You know why they, why they have abortion clinics? Those kids can't earn, earn a paycheck yet. They can't vote. They have no say about anything. They're dead weight. You get on the other end of the age spectrum, we're heading for that. I think there's something like six states that have a, a version of genocide laws for the elderly, for the infirm, already. And that's in America. There's some places where, man, if you just can't, can't take care of yourself, you better, you better watch it. If you, if you die suddenly, unexpectedly, nobody's even going to ask a question. They're glad you're gone. The Lord puts a value on all of life, not just the, uh, the young, not just the old, but all of it. But Jesus, verse 16, called unto them and said, Suffer the little children. That word suffer doesn't mean put up with them because they're, you know, you got to. They, you'll look like you're unfriendly if you don't. To suffer means allow. Jesus says, suffer it to be so for now. He says, allow it to be so for now. Put up with it for now. It'll, it'll be okay. So he says, uh, suffer little children to come unto me, allow them, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. That begins preparing us for a lesson for, for we adults. How is it that we are supposed to become children? Well, I think the world has the idea well, when you're in your 60s and your 70s, and you dress up in kids' clothes and try and look like a 12-year-old girl again, or try and look like a, you know, you got the big, the guy's got the big comb over where he's got his hair wrapped around it, it looks like an ice cream cone. All that crazy stuff. I don't think that's at all what the Lord had in mind here. He had in mind some things we're going to talk about here in just a second. But he ends it with, with this very simple summation of the relationship that he's trying to illustrate here. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child. So again, we're back to how do little children receive things? How do they take to things? Shall in no wise enter therein. David has compared himself to a child. People uh, might not think of doing that because they don't want to be thought of as childlike. That's usually simplistic and trusting. You know, we're all too sophisticated to be simplistic and trusting. We have to have a doubt and uh, cynicism and all that kind of business. But Jesus said the keys to the entering into the kingdom of God is to have that childlike attitude. Children are very trusting. Uh, children uh, don't have to be persuaded there's a God. They just have to be shown how you talk to them. Children don't argue about prayer, typically. Once they understand they're talking to somebody just that they can't see, any more than you're spooked uh, about talking on the telephone to somebody. You can't see them. And well, I hear instant answer from them. Yeah, I'll be talking to the Lord. You may not hear an instant answer, but you're going to get one. But just be patient. Uh, you're not listening very close. So at any rate, uh, Jesus had interest in children that were infants here. He, had, uh, he was one once. He had an interest in Matthew 19, little children. In uh, Mark, it was young children. Uh, there were young men around him that want to put the children away, kind of maybe thinking they're much more important. I mean, that's really what your youth is about, isn't it? I'm strong, I'm important, I'm vital. Yeah. <laughs> And then you get to be in your 30s and 40s and you realize, wow, what a waste of life back then. If only I uh, knew now what I knew, or knew then what I knew now. At any rate, so he says that except you uh, become as a little child and receive the kingdom of God, you should know why it's in the room. Infants are helpless to do anything for themselves. Little Sienna is uh, cute as a button. If he's out uh, getting dressed, how's that work out? I bet she tries. Yeah. 
It, it was cute to watch. It? Yeah, it just doesn't work out. They're just not ready yet. Got a ways to go. But there's that effort. There's that enthusiasm. I can remember our kids. You try and teach them to tie their shoes. And the first year, attempts are usually just holding one and wrapping the other one around it enough to where you let go and it just all falls away. But they're trying. They're, they're looking to do something. They're trying to move on and make some advancement. But their, their lack of ability uh, only engenders a smile from those who are, have been there, who have seen this kind of thing play out before. And isn't it like the Lord to look at the, yeah, they're coming. They're coming. Yeah, we look at people sometimes in great frustration. Man, you've been saved for, for six months. You've been saved for a year. What did you do that for? The Lord says, well, you were doing that when you were two. <laughs> oh, yeah. So at any rate, children teach you patience. So those that are in the kingdom of, of the kingdom of God already will learn patience by new people coming along. It will help them in their walk. Uh, no one has to criticize uh, children for being children. It's the most normal thing, or their dependents. And nobody looks at a six-week-old baby and says, why don't you get up and go clean up your room? <laughs> you don't expect them to do anything. What you expect them to do is just what babies do. And if they're doing that, you're happy because that's normal. If they're not doing what's normal, then you're really worried. As babies, babies have a certain thing. They are constantly needy. I was reminded of this uh, the other day. I listened to something. And uh, uh, Anna, I'm sure, is gathering all of this as any new mother again. Uh, or for the first time even is, uh, understands. When babies are born, they require constant attention. Say, so, well, you can leave the room. Yeah, but your, your ears are still at the door. You might be in the other room, but your eyes are still trying to look around the corner. Your heart is still in that room with that little one that can't possibly be left alone. And that's just the way it is. And I think the Lord says, uh, my heart's there with you. Get on in all the way and grow up and make me proud. Constantly dependent, constantly needy. They can't vocalize their needs uh, specifically, but they can sure let you know when they need something. Uh, after a while, it always amazed me how mothers, they know what their baby needs. Steve here, here Jane crying. Hey, baby's crying. Yeah, she needs to be changed, or she's hungry, or she's <laughs> she, she wants a lollipop, whatever. Moms just uh, just kind of know that. Dads just kind of go along for the ride, I think. And uh, we're the alarm. Okay. You can tell. <laughs> I bet the most comfortable seat in Sienna's life is right where she is right now. <laughs> right in mom's lap. There's, there's no place that's as comfortable until they get that independent spirit where I don't need you anymore. It isn't they don't care. It's just it's that newfound independence of I can sit all by myself. I can climb up in that chair. I can do this all by myself. And you know what? I think the Lord wants us to depend on him. He is our intercessor. He ever liveth to make intercession for us because we never run out of need. We ne he, never, uh, he never runs out of patience with us. Thank God for that. <clears throat> Children love to be comforted. They love to be held. They love to be uh, fawned over. And why is that? Because they're children. That's what it's all about when you're a child. Jesus is willing to do that. And he's willing to do it with you, you and I. He's Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Come over here, I'll help you. <laughs> Come over here, I'll pat you on the back. I'll rub you back. I'll you know, comb your hair, do whatever you want to do. God cares about us. I think what he's trying to illustrate here is we don't seem to care enough about ourselves to listen to him, to need him like we want. At some point in your Christian life, you know, you begin thinking, I can do it. And the Lord says, uh-oh. You know what happens when that? Uh, Kids get to be 12 or 13, somewhere around that age. They go from these cute little, little 
kids, Mom, Dad, can I do this? I'm going to go do this. They don't consult anymore. They don't ask opinions anymore. They don't look for uh, guidance anymore. And I fear that as Christians, a lot of times as we get older, we think, oh, I know all about this. I know how to do this. And, uh, the truth is, you know what? In God's eyes, we're always his children. And I would, I would, my dad was in his 70s, I was in my, uh, my 50s. You know who I was? Son. Never, listen, if he lived to be 200 and I was uh, 180, I'd still be son. <laughs> and to a certain degree, I think my dad was really that, that idiot. <laughs> Jesus is willing to touch them if someone would just bring them. Someone to provide for them because they couldn't for themselves. They didn't know what they needed, but they knew they had a need. Kids make a mess. And you leave two or three little kids, year old kids in a room by themselves for 15 minutes. <laughs> you come back, you, how in the world did they get that much done? They, they can't physically really do anything, but boy, what a mess they can make. Well, the child left to himself bringing his mother to shame, and the Lord says, I don't want you left by yourself. No tell them what you'll do. I got my eye on you, and I want you to always come to me. I always want you to ask me. I always want you to tell me what you're thinking, how you're feeling about this. We'll talk it out. The, uh, they don't do it intentionally, but even in early life, you must clean them at every end and every angle. They typically enjoy being clean, but that doesn't keep them from getting filthy. <laughs> How many of you like to be really clean? All confessed, prayed up, everything done? Why don't we stay up? Isn't that bizarre? And you think, man, that feels so good when you're right with the Lord. There's nothing hanging over your head. No guilty conscience. No little little boys telling you, you know, you shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have looked over there. You shouldn't have done that. Man, I had it. Makes you wonder, well, what are we doing? Prone to wander. What would I feel? Prone to leave the Lord. Well, that's, that's the human nature. Kids are not skeptics. They'll believe just about anything mom and dad tell them. You know why they do that? They learn early on. Everything I have comes from them. My, uh, my son Josh, when he was probably about five, going to school, and I got a phone call one morning. It was Christmas season. And it was the principal of Deans Mill School. Right? Yeah, Deans Mill School. He might have been a little bit older than and uh, the principal said, uh, we, we've got kind of an issue here. I said, well, what is it? He said, it's, uh, well, Josh was telling a whole bunch of kids on the school bus that there's no Santa Claus. And I'm kind of weak. Well, a lot of people believe there is. <laughs> I said, well, is there? Well, uh, no. I said, so, so he told him the truth. Okay, now what's the problem? Well, you know, a lot of kids believe that. I said, a lot of people believe a lot of crazy things. He said, what are you getting mad about the truth? I said, what else did he tell him? Well, he said, he, he said, there's no Santa Claus. You get all those presents from mom and dad because they love you. So I... <laughs> I was grinning so bad. So what's the problem? Well, a lot of people don't believe in Santa Claus. Oh, that's their problem. <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't know whether they're ever so proud of a kid. It's the, it's the craziest thing of how people think. Well, you just told somebody the truth. You spoiled everything for them. You know why it's safe to tell kids the truth? Because they'll believe you. <laughs> and 
And if you tell them a lie, they'll believe you. But that's not safe. It's not ever a good idea to lie to children. They say, well, what about the tooth fairy? I, I, I'd be really careful about all of that kind of stuff. I know it's cute. I know everybody does it. I know everybody has a good time. But half the time, the, kid, the, the kids are humoring you. They know that's baloney. And they're just having to get another quarter out of it. I kind of go along with, it, with the game here. But it teaches them these plain games. What we need is honest people. At any rate, kids are not uh, typically skeptics until they learn to be by mistrust. Uh, if, if a parent has a child's trust, they have a child's respect. Because the minute they don't trust you, they don't respect you anymore. And if you tell them stories that turn out not to be true, they may laugh about it, but in the back of their mind, they wonder what else they told me that isn't true. How else am I going to look silly sometime? It's not true. Kids have confidence in mom and dad. You know, uh, I think everybody enjoys it when people say, well, I trust you. And that's a good thing. Does, can God trust us? Well, I, I think he knows who we are. Within that framework, I suspect we can be trusted. But wouldn't it be great if, we could, if God could trust us without reservation, like we can trust him as a good father, as a good uh, spiritual head? Children have an amazing capacity for love. I've seen kids that were horribly abused. And yet, by any stretch of the imagination, they love their parents. Yeah, I just don't understand. There's just something in the human heart that is made to love those that bring you life. And who brought more life than the Lord Jesus Christ? He created the world and all things in it, gave us life. He made a parental system, a family system, whereby we can have life and perpetuate that so we can see from a, a uh, position of maker, our responsibility, our love, and our devotion to the creation that we've made, our children. You see, if that's how God feels, he can be trusted. I remember years ago at the prison, talking one night about godly fathers and trusting fathers. Something I would make his father dad. I don't remember how the context was. And I got all these blank looks like, you realize, nobody there, or at least half the people, don't even know who their father was. If they knew him, they only resented the fact that he left their mother high and dry, left them half hungry all the time, and never did a thing for them. Don't be like those people. They, children love without question. Children are humble. Until they get up to a certain age, what they wear, how they look, I mean, there's dirt all over their face, doesn't face them. Reach a certain age, also got to be clean. Can't get them in the shower, they get up around 12, 13, 14, can't get them out. There's something about, what did they learn in all of this stuff? They've lost that innocence of childhood. They've lost that innocence of, I'm just who I am. And they try and be somebody that they're patterning their life after. Let's make it somebody that's worth following. <coughs> Proverbs 20, verse 11 says, Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work is pure and whether it be right. You know, there's, uh, there's nothing that makes parents happier than to uh, be talking to the neighbors and say, Well, your kid is really something. They're, they're such a blessing. They're such a helper. They're just so kind. They're so sweet. I think now we're so disassociated from neighbors, from everybody. You probably wouldn't hear that simply because we have no interaction with anybody that's close enough to us to ever, to ever comment on them. We've lost a lot of, of things in the electronic world where everybody slips into and disappears. The Bible says that we are the children of light. We're to be children walking in obedience to our Heavenly Father. Amen.
describes us as newborn babes. I'm glad the Lord says, uh, bring them to me. I'll get them. I'll take care of them. I'll nurture them. I'll help them. I'll uh, see to their needs. I'll provide for them. Lord certainly uh, got a good plan for us. I'm enjoying it. I don't know about you. I'm on the uh, way on the far end of it from some of you. But I'll tell you this. The Lord is good. The closer you get to him, the more you'll enjoy life. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we again thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that you might consider us as your little children. Lord, help us honor you, reverence you, respect you, trust you. Lord, have no fear of you. Lord, have a response to your call that can't wait to get in your presence, can't wait to be with you, can't wait to hear from you. Lord, the excitement that comes with the child meeting with uh, their dad or their mom, what a blessing. We ask God tonight that you just uh, minister to the needs of each one of our hearts, each of our families. Lord, help us to be useful. Help us to be fruitful witnesses for you. And uh, Lord, you said uh, some, uh, some uh, planted, some watered, but you provided the increase. Lord, help us to do our little part in this world and this life and just trust you for all of the things only a wise and a gracious and a loving Heavenly Father could provide. We thank you, Lord, tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's... Uh...